Right, look, everybody all can see that. Okay, recording in progress. Got it. I'm supposed to say got it. Uh, I can't say got it, <laughs> which means it's now in the way of my... Hang on just a second, folks. <laughs> That's odd. Uh, okay. I couldn't present because there was a thing up there telling me it was being recorded. Here we go. All right. Uh, I, uh, I, I had the real pleasure and on, honest pleasure of uh, judging one of your contests not too long ago, and uh, it's kind of nice to see some of you all came back. <laughs> I guess you didn't, didn't hold my critiques against me, um, but uh, I do uh, I, I do try to, whenever I'm talking with photographers, uh, we, we, we all come from basically the same stock, although sometimes it's helpful to even know that it goes back further than that. Um, and so today's tonight's talk is about uh, uh, the, a brief history of photography, focusing primarily on the 19th century. But um, but there's a little bit more than that. Um, I am a, a professional photographer, which basically means that I uh, don't make any money at photography <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> uh, but I, I certainly enjoy it, and, um, and 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 I do mostly portrait photography. Uh, I love. I used to uh, photograph trees, and mountains, and buildings, and I found that I didn't have to ask them for uh, permission to take their picture, and they were never going to tell me no. And I realized that that was something I had to change. And uh, now I really love working with uh, working with people in the studio. So um, tonight's talk is called "Before There Was Digital: A Brief History of Photography," and I will jump right in uh, just by way of a background. I've been a professional photographer, uh, photographer for a little over 50 years. Uh, my dad taught me film photography in darker when I was 12. Um, and the most recent thing that happened in, in, in my uh, photography life was uh, in January at the, uh, in, uh, the Imaging USA convention in, uh, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. I uh, received my master's of photography degree from the Professional Photographers of America. So. Um, very happy to join you all tonight and we're going to just jump right in and you know it's it's kind of hard when you're getting ready to to talk about uh a, a, a topic to figure out how do you condense that into uh into something that that it can people can people can stand a friend of mine once said that uh, the mind can only can only take in what the butt can endure um and so what i'm going to try to do is condense a story that's 14 almost 14 billion years old down into about an hour, we'll try to keep it an hour and a half. And the way you do that is by starting from scratch. And I, I go back to some, I guess a lot of the folks on the call here have heard of Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan said, if you really want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So uh, I, I kind of like that. And I thought about, well, maybe we should go back to the very beginnings of, uh, of this, uh, this process. In the very beginning, of course, we uh, had what we call the Big Bang. And when the Big Bang first occurred during this first approximately 400 million years, which seems like nothing when you look at it in a short video, but it was forever in terms of what it took to get everything to get together, no light escaped. The universe didn't have any light. It had light. It had photons. In fact, photons were invented about 10 minutes into the history of the universe, uh, but they couldn't escape because the universe was so dense. So um, approximately 14, 13.4 billion years later, um, probably the most important thing in the history of mankind at the time happened, and one of the most important photographs was made. One of the most memorable moments in my entire life um, was was that night on December 24th, 1968, listening to the astronauts as they orbited the orbited the uh, the moon. Um, 
Galen Rowell, I know a lot of you probably know who Galen Rowell was. He's one of the, the most famous nature photographers in the world um, and a pretty dang good photographer. Once said that this uh, Earthrise by uh, Bill Anders was one of the most influential photographs, environmental photographs ever made. I contend or, or, or propose that it's perhaps one of the most fundamental and important photographs in history. So we start at the beginning of the universe all the way up until perhaps the most important photograph in history. When we start, when we actually took a look back at ourselves um, from, from off of our, off of our home, uh, home Earth. Um, and so Earthrise was kind of fun in how it happened because the, they were orbiting the back of the moon and as they pop up and all of a sudden they see the Earth. And um, Bill Anders says, oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Frank Borman, the uh, commander of the mission, says, hey, don't take that. It's not scheduled. That's the way things are in NASA. And then Anders says, hey, you got to roll a color film, which is just a cartridge that goes on the back. And uh, Jim Lovell says, oh, man, that's great. Some of you may remember Jim Lovell from Apollo 13. Um, if you ever are in dire need of a camera and you really want a really, really good one, that particular Hasselblad camera is available um, for free. It's worth uh, probably at least a quarter of a million dollars, but it is available for free. All you have to do is go to the moon. Um, it's sitting, sitting at Tranquility Base on the moon. It was left behind after Apollo 11 because they figured they could leave the camera behind and take a few extra moon rocks. Um, a little bit after that, another important event in human history happened. This uh, little star called Arendelle. Um, some of you may have ever heard have heard of Arendelle. Um, NASA announced that they had discovered Arendelle uh, via the Hubble Space Telescope. Arendelle was a planet that was probably emitted the rays of light that we saw through the Hubble Telescope 900 million years after the Big Bang, which was over 13, almost 13 billion years ago. So the light that was sent out was actually to travel through space in, in a, I would say a straight line, but it was actually through what's known as gravitational lensing. And the, so that it was able to reach the Earth and we saw it through a camera. The Hubble Space Telescope is a great big camera. Um, and so this little plant, this little uh, star, the first time we've ever discovered a star, star that far away, that old. In fact, more than likely that star doesn't even exist any longer, but it did 13 billion years ago and it sent its light out. And that light traveled all the way to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, if some of you are familiar with the cosmology, that is the, the understanding of the universe in terms of the Big Bang, and the Big Bang says that in the first 400 million years, there were no stars. There were basically, initially there was a, a dense explosion. Uh, then there was photons flowing around, but they could not escape the, the, uh, the dense uh, material of uh, after the uh, bang, uh, which is all the best that anybody can describe is it's a bang. It expanded and expanded and expanded, what, uh, went through a series of what were called quantum fluctuations. Atoms started to happen. And once the atoms started to come together, um, there was enough light emitted by the universe that you can actually still see it. It's called the um, cosmic microwave background. In the cosmic microwave background, if you look up in the sky, all you see is dark. But a, 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 uh, an astrophysicist looks up in the sky and they see these little glowing bits of um, the, the afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, it takes a radio telescope to see them because it's actually in the um, microwave region. That's why it's called the microwave background. But it's still light. Light in, it is just a mag, electromagnetic radiation. Um, and the physicists will tell us that um, you know, light is light. It doesn't matter what its wavelength is. It just happens to be visible light is what we can see. Now, after Hubble, 
We, uh, some of you all recall a couple of years ago, we got all excited when the James Webb Space Telescope launched. I believe it was on Christmas, at Christmas, uh, a couple of years ago. And the first image that the, Hub, Hub, that the uh, James Webb Space Telescope sent back was a picture of where Arendelle lives. Um, Arendelle lives in a cluster of galaxies called SMAX. And behind SMAX is some galaxies and stars that are very, very, very old. And because of the gravity of the SMAX light, uh, cluster, uh, all of the gravity of all the stars and galaxies combined together, it actually warps space-time so that light is, is magnified. It's like a, an optical lens, but it's from gravity. And you can see the difference between the Webb telescope and the Hubble telescope. And so the Webb has started looking back further and further to where none of us have gone. Uh, it's amazing stuff to me and to think about the fact that these are, by the way, both photographs. Um, it's kind of like having, you know, some of y'all, my very first digital camera was, uh, I think it was 400 and 460 kilo, kilopixels. Uh, and then my my next was like two megapixels and now I shoot with a uh, when I shoot with digitally I shoot with a uh, a, a Nikon D850 45 megapixels but uh, it's kind of the diff that's sort of the difference between the James Webb and the Hubble Space Telescope but they're both cameras big old cameras and the interesting thing is they've discovered um, light coming from galaxy 10 galaxies that are about 830 million years they were they actually were created about 800 million years after the big bang um, and that they are linked together it's amazing that they can do the same things that we can do um, any of you all have ever seen any forensic photography um, it's amazing what can be done can be determined by by the photographs if we look at them in the right way and it to me if i were to look at this field of stars, I would say, that's crazy. I don't see how those are connected, but the astrophysicists do. This is, uh, I don't know if any of you all know or have ever heard of Barbara Brown Taylor. She's a theologian and a writer, but um, she's also a, a follower of Buckminster Fuller. And I couldn't find a quote directly from Fuller, but basically she says, and, and he said something to the effect of, we are stardust and to stardust we shall return. And the reason I say that is because our story of the history of photography really begins by human beings looking up at the sky, the twinkling lights above us. Even before we had recorded history, we started gazing at the light from the heavens to try to make sense of what brought us into being in our place in the universe. And in, in, this is a, a, a the, on the left are a series of, um, of photographs and a couple of paintings of some of the famous uh, 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 astro astronomers and astrophysicists in history. Uh, the, 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 second, uh, the first guy is Ptolemy. The second guy is Hubble himself. Of course, you've, you've seen Hawking and Einstein. Um, Kepler uh, is down in the lower right. Um, Tyson, Sagan. And then a couple of important other important folks that um, I, I'm going to draw your attention to tonight uh, briefly. The first is Sir John Herschel. John Herschel, his father was Sir William Herschel. William Herschel was was an astronomer, and so was John Herschel. John Herschel was a mathematician, astronomer, inventor. He was a polymath, is what they call him. Um, and this photograph of him was made in the 1880s by Julia Margaret Cameron. Um, I say 80s, maybe 70s. Um, he was late in, in at age. But a um, couple of important things that we'll talk about later on in the presentation about uh, Herschel. And then another important photographer, uh, excuse me, person who used photography with um, astrophysics was Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Uh, uh, Ms. Leavitt discovered um, what's known as the, the variable patterns of Cepha the the uh, how do we say it? the right way to say it? I keep I don't have, I never get it exactly right because I don't fully understand it. But it is basically there's these these uh, certain sets of stars in the sky are called Cepheid variables and they blink, 
and she determined that the further away they were, the the blinking was was less, and that they could determine the based on the the pattern of the blinking and how far the star away she could star was. She figured out how that you uh, that you could uh, uh, you could tell how old how far away that star was, and it was the first the ha the start of how we began measuring the universe around us. Um, the interesting thing about what she did was she never. Uh, maybe very, very late in life, but during most of her research, she only looked at glass plate negatives, glass plates of star fields, and was able to determine all of her work by looking at plates, photographs of of the stars, and determine determined where how, how uh, where we fit in the universe. Herschel actually named our craft um, before Herschel coined the term photography or photograph, um, there were various terms used for the, the relationship of light and, and making impressions on, on, um, uh, on our world. And it, it, essentially, they were called heliographs or sun writing or sun drawing were the most common terms, but there was no universal term. And Herschel came up with the term photograph, which is, comes from the Greek Phos or photos, which is light, and graph, which is a drawing or writing, and it, so it becomes a photograph. Now, I like the uh, definition that um, Wikipedia gives to uh, photography. Uh, it's photography is the art application and practice of creating durable images by recording light, either electronically or by means of an image sensor or chemical means of a light sensitive material such as photographic film. Um, I, I personally like that definition because what that says is is that it a photograph is is it has to has to be operated on by light. You have to use light to make a photograph, um, which means if you're creating a pure AI image, it's it may be an AI image and it may be a beautiful image and it may be a beautiful picture, but it's probably not really appropriately called a photograph. A lot of discussion in the in the um, in the industry today, but um, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Um, let's talk a little bit about a little bit about the science of photography, because it has to do with how how things were found and discovered. Um, for many 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 years, human beings observed that certain substances, especially those containing chlorophyll, chlorophyll, were sensitive to light. If you took a um, a, a plant and you put it inside and you didn't give it any light it would die you put it back outside and give it a little water and it would resurrect it would come back um, and so plants have a contain a chemical called chlorophyll and it was interesting that this was this has been known for for uh, eons for millennia that that there were certain things that when the sun was out they were good when the sun was not out they were bad and um, so our Chlorophyll is one of the most is the earliest known substance to be sensitive to light. Now, in the late in in the 1700s, uh, a number of uh, scientists, chemists, really started making some discoveries about other materials sensitive to light, and and they were honing in on the behavior of the uh, element silver. Um, because it turns out that silver nitrate is a chemical that has been used for centuries to um, separate gold from silver. And typically, gold and silver are found together, um, sometimes gold, silver, and copper, sometimes iron as well. And silver nitrate helps to separate those chemicals out. And the important thing was, of course, getting the gold, because the gold is most, most important. Um, but then silver nitrate was also uh, 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 Johann Schultz discovered that it's sensitive to, that it that silver nitrate itself is sensitive to light, and uh, about 60 years after Schultz's work, uh, uh, Carl Scheele uh, discovered that um, silver chloride, which is a is is called is known as a halogen. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Silver chloride was very sensitive to violet light. He discovered that by accidentally knocking over a bottle of silver chloride and he stuck it in the uh, in, a, in a cabinet to, and he pulled it back out. 
and it was it hadn't hadn't stained the paper but then he had it outside for a few minutes and then all of a sudden the paper was stained and he discovered that silver chloride was light sensitive um, Johann Ritter at the turn at the beginning of the 19th century said that silver chloride was not only just sensitive to sunlight but also this magical light they called actinic light um, and that's actually you go look that word up actinic um, essentially it's violet blue and ultraviolet light turns out that all film is sensitive primarily to violet blue blue violet and ultraviolet light Thomas Wedgwood um, actually took a camera and put his light sensitive chemical into the camera and actually made photographs in 1802. But the problem was his photographs would fade as soon as they were in sunlight. And many of you all have seen that if you went down to the drugstore 20, 30 years ago, picked up your, your, your photographs and then set them in, a, in, a, in the window, they would fade. Same basic problem, I mean, the, the, and we'll talk more about the important discovery that made photography photography. But then after Wedgwood, along with Wedgwood, was Sir Humphrey Davy, Davy and Davy was actually um, doing a lot of research into to microscopy, um, microscopes, uh, opt, optical, you know, opticians mm -hmm. and optical instruments have been around for mm, 16, 1700, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, and Davy uh, this realized that you could actually enlarge a photograph by taking a the the, the camera and reversing it, and and that's how enlargers work today. Now, these are two of the most important books <clears throat> that I personally have in my library that that this information comes from, and I encourage you to to, to jot these names down. One's called The Keepers of Light, and the other's The Silver Sunbeam. Um, Silver Sunbeam was written in 1864 and talked about the state of the photographic art in 1864. And uh, Crawford wrote his book in, in the mid, uh, probably around the 1950s, I believe, um, and talked about the history of photography at the time. Now, silver is an interesting metal. It happens to be even more reflective than gold. It is a precious metal. Um, it is a byproduct that it was basically comes whenever you're trying to, to mine gold, copper, lead, zinc, silver is always there. The interesting thing about silver, and in fact all of these, these precious metals is, there's not enough energy in our entire solar system to create those metals. They, they can only be created when two neutron stars collide and create a, uh, a black hole. And so all that stuff that happens somehow made its way to Earth. And so this magical chemist, chemical called silver um, ended, up, ended up on our planet in these veins and, and things. And that's, you know, of course, over about 4.6 billion years of history of our planet. But the, the chemistry behind all of this, if you look at it, all of almost all of our... Um, materials heavier than um, hydrogen, uh, helium, and lithium uh, come from other planets, come other places. So the hydrogen was natural from the Big Bang, but everything else has been fused or fissioned or created by other places that come to us. So none of this stuff is really ours, which makes it really, truly very precious and the chemicals, the reason they become um, sensitive to light is through a, what's known as a halogen. A halogen are, is a particular column in the column 17 in the periodic table that when combined with these precious metals uh, become, creates salts and they are, they are light sensitive. And so the primary salts used in photography and you'll see that these go all the way back to 1700s, 1717, when uh, um, Schultz was, was discovering that they were light sensitive. They're still light sensitive today. If you st if you use film, or or if you still have a, an X-ray done by uh, a, an actual X-ray machine, all of that stuff uses one or more of these chemicals. So here's a question: um, If anybody knows the answer to this, raise your hand. Who invented the camera? Does anybody know who invented the camera? Not seeing any hands raised. Okay. 
actually the Chinese invented the camera way back before um, the, the uh, BCE, before uh, before Christ, fifth fifth century. Um, the 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 idea of the camera obscura, and then the um, all the way into the uh, 1600s, um, the term camera, and in 1600, the term camera obscura first started being used, which was a box, which you see in the photograph on the right, where a hole is drilled in a wall, and through that hole, and that's called a pinhole, we, some of you may have made in your, in your life a pinhole camera, the image is projected on a wall on the opposite side, upside down and backwards. And an artist could take and then draw the picture on the wall of what was on the scene in the in the outside. And they would have these big boxes they would take around. So they weren't able to fix it other than to draw by hand. But in the in six, the sixteen hundreds, camera obscuras became very popular in Europe. Now the early uh, op optics op 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 optics as a science. It's been around again for centuries um, between telescopes, eyeglasses, um, microscopes. But in 1807, um, a fellow by the name of William Hyde Wollaston invented what's known as the camera lucida. And if you look on the left, that's the camera lucida. And the camera lucida essentially is a prism. It's like a split mirror, if you've ever used a split mirror before. Um, you've probably used, a, 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 if you have a DSLR, um, you have used a, a penta prism, which is just a prism that actually turns everything right side back up, as opposed to upside down and backwards. Um, your, all of your SLR cameras have prisms in them. Um, you've used prisms in science experiments where you split off in a spectrum. Williston invented the uh, the camera lucida because it would it could it was easy to port around you could take it with you if you went on a trip if you were to go um, on some uh, expedition you could take it with you and draw pictures of the scenes for people who were not very crafty with with drawing um, a little bit later he invented a lens called the Wollaston meniscus lens which is still in use today I actually have one mine is a modern make it was only made a couple of years ago um, but it's based on the same principle that Wollaston used and so a lot of artists had it would use what was known as a camera obscura in a box with a Wollaston lens they would put trans tracing paper over the top of her glass in the box it would hit the mirror and they could then trace a picture, just like as if you were projecting it on, the, on an actual box. And that's important, by the way, in the history of photography, even though it's, it's an art tool. Some of you may have seen this photograph before. Um, in 1826-27, not real sure, um, a, a, a Frenchman by the name of Niesipor Nieps, I can never pronounce his name right, but that's somewhere close, um, was working with, uh, one of the things that had been discovered, uh, another material is, is asphalt. Um, if you've ever watched, looked at a road, you can tell how old a road is by the color of the asphalt. If it's very black, it means it's just recently been paved. If it's faded, it's because light has acted upon that, that uh, the asphalt. Asphalt is a chemical known as bitumen, um, and bitumen is, is actually, um, sensitive to light just like some of these other chemicals and so Nieps took a piece of bitumen and it's about it's about a size I think about a four by five plate um, and he he coated it with bitumen and he put it in a camera obscura and pointed it out the window of his studio or actually his bedroom window um, and and it, and made what's recognized as the very first photograph in history a permanent image made only by the light of the sun acting on chemicals um, under human control. And uh, it's very difficult to see. The, the plate is still available. It's still around. It's actually be, it's kept at the uh, University of Texas in Austin. Um, it's very rarely shown because it's not fixed. It will fade. And as you can see, that's what it currently looks like on the left. And that's quite faded. But if you take the image on the left and you flip it upside down you get the and, and enhance it a little bit probably through Photoshop or whatever you get the image on the right and that's the scene 
that Niepce saw out the his his bedroom window. Now Niepce had a friend named Louis de Guerre, and Louis de Guerre was kind of a hustler. Um, he 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 was a scientist of sorts, but really not as good a scientist as Niepce was. And when Niepce showed de Guerre his um, plate, his photograph, um, de Guerre becomes ex immediately interested in it, and they begin to work together by taking a piece of silver plated with copper and then exposing it to the vapors of iodine. Remember, iodine and silver make a hal uh, halogen, silver iodide. And in this way, they could make a more contrasty image than the kind of blurry thing that Niepce had made before. And so they started working together on a process to do that. And in the in the middle of working on this stuff, um, Niepce dies, and 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 uh, Daguerre basically takes on his work as if it were his own. Um, and in it, certain details, he would not Daguerre never would have figured out himself if it had not been for Niepce. So in a sense, Niepce could be could could lay claim to be the father of photography, of actual modern day photography, because. It was the two together working with Niepce's work that discovered the possibility of the latent image. A latent image is an image impressed on something that doesn't appear until you treat it with some other chemical. Um, and that's called developing. And that's what made the daguerreotype a reality. On Monday um, afternoon, August 19th, 1839, the French Academy that. of Science held a special meeting to publicly disclose this is the, the Daguerre. of making daguerreotypes. The Technique's inventor, Louis-Jacques-Marne de Guerre, had sold his formula to the French government so that it could be made freely available to the public without patent restrictions. The new medium seized the public's imagination. Daguerreotype mania swept through Paris and across Europe. All who saw daguerreotypes for the first time were equally impressed. Viewers took them to be completely faithful depictions of nature. As quickly as railroads and steamships could travel, News of the invention spread around the world. Nowhere was the daguerreotype more popular than in America, a young democracy and a mecca of progress. Now I'm going to stop the video right there and talk about, at the same time, um, a fellow by the name... Uh, now, Daguerre and Niepce were French. And, of course, not to be outdone by the French, the British were also, at the same time, working on, on similar... similar uh, similar things and a fellow by the name of William Henry Fox Talbot turns out um, he, he loved to travel but he was an awful artist he couldn't draw his way out of a paper bag um, he was such a terrible artist and he knew it um, and so he was very interested in the work that Scheele and um, um, pardon me the the others that are on the first chart had it had done where they took a piece of paper and sensitized it with a chemical and put it in a camera obscura and so he started working with that and to to try to make a, a camera based uh, you know a, a on paper he was working with paper so essentially if you remember the paper the sheet of paper with the um, silver chloride was the very first light sensitive paper and so going all the way back to that discovery Talbot thought well golly I can't draw I can't save my life but maybe I could use the camera obscura with a piece of paper that's sensitive to the light so I don't have to draw it and so he began working on that and he didn't actually invented the photograph um, using silver chloride or originally he started with sodium chloride some of you may know that's uh, put you, what you put on dinner tonight it's salt um, and so he, he, ordinary salt, but it didn't work as well as silver chloride did. And his problem was that he would make the image, and then just like Niepce's photograph from out his bedroom window, it would begin to fade with time. Because what happened was the light was affecting the silver halides, but then it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop affecting it once it came out into the sunlight. You needed to have a way of stopping the uh, light sensitive process you need to render it no longer light sensitive and he he couldn't get past that um <clears throat> so he uh based on yeah wedgwood was the name i couldn't get 
he came up with the idea of the negative. A negative was something that he could take a piece of paper and then he could shine light through it to another piece of paper similarly uh, coated with the chemicals so that they would then he could make he could make ultimate number he could make infinite numbers of prints um, and in fact uh, one of the things that he he, he began to work um, with let's see that that's uh, da, 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 da. you make a negative okay so you have you have the negative process which is what um, Talbot came up with and he would put wax or some kind of a mastic on the back of his paper to make them more translucent and so he could then make reproductions of prints or you had the daguerreotype which could only make a single print and took a long time and neither was perfect but in the at the beginning of 1889 which the the Gettys video shows that daguerre came out with the daguerreotype well actually daguerre sold his patent to the French government um, he didn't give it away um, but basically he came forward and said I've made this discovery I've made photography and not to be outdone Talbot said wait I've already made photography and he came out with it so he made an exhibition of his prints and the problem was that neither of them really made it work right until um, they got help from Sir John Frederick William Herschel John Herschel um, Herschel was a chemist as I said he was a polymath probably one of the smartest people in history had he been around at the time of uh, of Einstein he would have been able to tell Einstein how to fix his his theories um, he was he was just that smart but he was as a chemist he figured out um, that he could he could make camera negatives from positives as well and he figured out a chemical that a chemical called hypo any of you heard of hypo some of some of the old guys probably remember hypo hypo is sodium thiosulfate and and he had been working with this chemical of a lot of other chemicals and discovered that it would wash away the um, the halogens that had not been exposed by light it would dissolve them and that those that had been developed with a chemical developer and had been exposed to light would be permanent they'd be permanently affixed and um, Herschel basically uh, happened to share was working directly with he, Herschel was British he's working with Talbot Talbot figures out how to solve his problem and is now telling the world I've invented photography ignore this Frenchman and the Frenchman is saying hey wait a second ours is more it's prettier it's better and and what what most people never hear is the rest of that story it turns out that the guy who was sell, selling the sodium thiosulfate or as they called it at the time hyposulfite of soda the chemist that was selling that to um, Talbot was the same chemist that was selling his chemical the chemicals to Daguerre and that it just so happened that um, the chemist mentioned to Daguerre hey you should go talk to this guy Talbot the, because he's been using a whole lot of this sodium thio, this hyposulfite of soda and Talbot uh, and Daguerre says oh really and he goes and he looks at it and he discovers that it's the one problem because he had the same problem that um, that Talbot had his his plates were beautiful but then they would fade away and so here in 1839 you suddenly have two different completely different discoverers of photography with different means of making photographs um, and there are, are different chemicals I'm not going to go into the details of how this worked but essentially the um, they both came out in 1839 with the daguerreotype which was made on on, on uh, copper plated silver and the calotype the Talbot invented which was based on paper and, and and eventually he ended up using silver iodide because it was even more light sensitive than silver chloride um, so essentially what he did was he took a con made a contact sheet if any of you all have ever made contact prints if you took a photography class back in college or if you've done any alternate process printing 
you'll know that a contact print is basically you take a negative, you lay it on top of a piece of light sensitive paper, expose it to the sun, and then you you print you have what you have resulting is you may need to treat it with a chemical either to develop it or just wash off the other stuff. You get a, a chemical you get a, a permanent photograph on the paper. The problem with both of these technologies was there were limitations and strengths. Um, the, the, the daguerreotype could only make a single image. You couldn't, you could only, each, each plate was what you got. And they were very small plates. I mean, if you've ever seen daguerreotypes, and they have a few over at the High Museum here in Atlanta, um, they're not very big. They're very small plates. They're because the silver, copper, sil copper plate and silver was very expensive, certainly back in the day. And they had to treat that the developer for those plates was mercury vapors. They would take it, put it over a, in, over a heated a a, a vat, a, a cup of mercury that's heated, and the mercury vapors actually made the developed the chemicals on the plate. Now, there's any of you all know that mercury vapor is not the most conducive to longevity of for the photographer if you're using it in the darkroom because it's really nasty stuff um, it's a very dangerous chemical and it will kill you if it doesn't make you go crazy first and then kill you um, so the, the thing about the the daguerreotype was they were very sharp but they were only one off you could never get a copy of it you couldn't publish it in a book you couldn't do anything else with it other than put it on your mantelpiece and say see what a beautiful picture i have it also took um, sometimes as long as six hours to make an, a single image. On the other hand, um, the the daguerreotype was very sharp, whereas the um, the 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 paper, the calotype, um, while it could make unlimited numbers of copies, it was based on paper, and the paper is based is if you're familiar with how paper is made, it's got all kinds of fibers in the paper. And those fibers interfere with the light. And so what happens is you get a soft image. So in here, you have a picture on the right, on the left, which is the very first known photograph, first authenticated photograph of Abraham Lincoln. It was a daguerreotype. There were very few daguerreotypes that Lincoln made. In fact, there were more of another process later on. On the right is, is Thomas Duncan, who was an artist, a painter of the, of the, of the age, and a friend of... Um, uh, 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 of Talbot's and and so you can see that the difference one is a very sharp image good contrast even though it's aged not aged well um, on the right it's very soft which is not very good it's great for um, you know like landscape photography but not real great for um, making portraits because people want to see their features sharp so in 1851 the Englishman Frederick Scott Archer invented the wet collodion process of making negatives. This process allowed photographers to produce finely detailed images on paper and to print an unlimited number of copies. These key features were improvements over the previous two photographic processes, the daguerreotype and the calotype. From 1851 until about 1880, the wet collodion process became the dominant method for making photographs throughout Europe and North America. Producing a wet collodion image had to be done quickly and efficiently. This is because collodion, the main chemical used, will dry up and lose its sensitivity after about 10 minutes. Photographers used portable dark rooms so the plate could be developed immediately after it was shot. That's a heck of a camera bag, isn't it? Post One heck of a camera bag, you had to drive around in carts. Archer um, was a sculptor and was dissatisfied with he he wanted to be able to make photographs of his sculpture pieces and he wanted to be sharp and even though he was a British uh, 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 subject he would and probably knew um, Talbot he was not pleased with the the softness of Talbot's images and he wanted something sharper that he could capture his sculptures on so he began working with albumen albumen egg whites. Um, and found that it was very difficult to pour albumin onto a piece of glass, um, which he had figured out was probably the thing to do because glass was clear and much clearer than paper. And, and if he would to be, could make an, a negative on the glass, 
by putting by putting some chemical on the glass so that he could then get his light sensitive halogens onto it then he could make a negative and then he could print unlimited numbers of prints from that by the way he had a lot of help in this process from guess who john herschel um, who who came up with the idea i believe that suggested to archer that he might use a chemical called collodion collodion is gun cotton um, it's basically uh, you take uh, uh, cotton rags cotton balls whatever you've got and you soak it in um, in nitric acid and it becomes when when you add ether and alcohol to it you can then dissolve certain salts these halogens in it so that you can you have now a, a material that will bond with glass and when it dries it dries clear and it would allow you to make a light sensitive plate on the piece of glass now the problem with gun cotton was it was very explosive um, it contains ether and alcohol and the nitric acid uh, working on the um, the the cotton nitrocellulose if you're familiar with the term nitrocellulose you know that that's the basis of tnt it goes boom um, in fact it turned out that after about the first year of the civil war both the north and the south began using gun cotton in their cannons instead of black powder because gun cotton was about 10 times more explosive than black powder and could send the, co the, the cannonballs much much further um, but by taking and coating a piece of glass with a, a, a slightly modified so that it wasn't quite as dangerous um, I have it in my studio it's called it's it's that goes by a slightly different name called pyroxylene pyroxylene or, anyway it's it's not as explosive it's still it's still inflammable and in fact will boil at 95 degrees um, Fahrenheit um, but when it evaporates it leaves a transparent film on the plate and so it allowed this was the breakthrough that Archer had where he could t then put the salts into this collodion put that into nitric uh, to, to silver nitrate and make a plate that was then um, able to be exposed to light now an, a wet collodion plate is actually um, you, you coat the plate either glass or a metal or some kind of material that, that and, and that's typically not porous because porous materials will just absorb the chemical it won't bond with the chemical but you put that plate in the camera and what you see is what you get it comes back out now those of you that have studied anything about cameras know that a camera when a when your film comes out of the camera it's upside down and backwards in fact it's upside down and backwards in your digital cameras only your processors in the cameras the microprocessors turn it right side up and show it to you properly but they're upside down and backwards and there were basically in the 1850s two type two important ways of making these plates um, the first was known as a tintype and they were called tintypes because typically they were made on pieces of cheap metal usually uh, some form of steel um, oftentimes tin cans you know the tin can was invented in the early uh, like 1802 I believe by Napoleon or for Napoleon as a way of storing foodstuffs for his battles for his, his campaigns and so they would take and put the so tin type referred to tin was just any kind of it was a it was a um, uh, an alloy but it was any kind of cheap metal was referred to as kind of a tin so a tin type was just a cheap pot metal um, and they would make you would put the put the chemicals on the tin type put the camera while, while it's still wet you would put the plate in the camera expose it and then develop it and that's your photograph now you couldn't replicate that photograph the only way you could replicate it was to take a photograph of the photograph which then you could replicate but then it takes time and process the alternative is known as the ambrotype and that's on the right the ambrotype is done on a piece of glass which is how Archer originally invented it and you coat the glass with the chemical um, you sensitize it you put it in the camera you expose it and develop it and fix it and then wash it now the glass image can be viewed one of two ways it can be either viewed on the surface of the glass 
in which case it's just like the tintype, it's backwards. And in fact, a lot of photographers, I say a lot, there's not that many photographers working in the process today, but some of the photographers that are will take and actually get gla black glass um, that's used typically for stained glass windows, and they will make their, their, their images right on the, the black glass. It's highly reflective, it's beautiful, they are stunning plates. Um, but the alternative is to flip it over so that the emulsion is on the back side of the plate and put some piece of black material behind it. If you still have old negatives, black and white negatives, try this someday as an experiment. Take a piece of black material, especially something shiny, and put your negative against it. And the silver on the negative actually turns white because it is whitish depending on, on the negative. And, and, and the, the, where there is no silver, is the black which is on a negative nothing is, is clear and so you get a, it's an optical illusion it looks like a natural image um, both of these photographs were made on a scanner um, one was the metal put on the scanner the other is the glass flipped upside down on the scanner with a piece of black metal just like in the other one as a reflective material I know that's going real fast through the process but um, it's kind of a fun process. In fact, uh, there's about a thousand of us on the planet, give or take, that are active in the process today. Um, and and I, I actually made a plate today. It kind of sucks. That's why I'm not showing it to you. <laughs> I wasn't very good. Um, the interesting thing about this process is there's about a million ways to screw up a photograph. Now, there's uh, another, uh, there's a, the end of the story about Archer. Archer watching what was going on with Daguerre um, selling his patent to the French government and Archer trying to make a profit off of his, Archer said, I'm just going to give it away for free. And he, he, he told people how he made his plate, how he, the chemicals that he used, exactly how it worked. You can actually find a copy on the internet today of Archer's original treatise on the subject where he talks about the chemicals he used, exactly how he did it. And so about 10 years after he invented the process, he died penniless because he never figured out a way to make a profit. And he was just a sculptor and, you know, nobody ever pays artists anything anyway, right? Um, interestingly, with the daguerreotype and even more so after the daguerreotype became the, <clears throat> the birth of the photography studio. And I'm sure you all have been to a photography studio, even if it was as a kid and, and a professional photographer brought their studio to your school and you had school portraits made or your kids had school portraits or your grandkids had school portraits. Um, the interesting thing about these processes and the birth of photography and in particular the, um, the, the Archer's wet collodion process was they were cheap enough to where many people could begin to have their photographs made. Um, up until the 1850s, even with the daguerreotype, although they were relatively inexpensive, that's relative to how images were made of important people before that time. You had to have, if you had an image from, if you were a, a wealthy person or someone important in history, the only way you'd have an image made was to have an engraving done. You'd hire a painter, the painter would paint a picture of you, an engraver would take that picture and engrave it onto plates and then they could make prints from that. It was a very expensive and time consuming process, could take up to six months. And the problem was, is only people of, of time and wealth, people of means, could actually afford to have their, their pictures made and put into books. Which is why before the 1850s, all of the books and all of the, the recorded history of, of human beings were primarily about white males, white men, because it was white men who could afford to have their image made afterward. In the 1850s, you started to see the plebeian society having their photographs made. It became quite a thing. In fact, um, in its heyday, uh, a, a wet collodion print, um, you could go to a studio and have a, a wet collodion photograph made a small one, but nonetheless, a wet collodion photograph called a sixth or a ninth plate, one one ninth of about eight by ten sheet, 
and it would cost about six dollars in today's day's money that would be the equivalent of what it costs to have your photograph made so anybody could have their photograph made it actually opened up the world to a different recorded history than what had happened beforehand um, and these these guys would build these elaborate um, uh, studios primarily based on the idea of a of a of a uh, a greenhouse a glass house they would call it with a dark room for the chem for the, the developing of the chemistries and these are a couple of examples <clears throat> from the late 18, 18, 1800s of, of studios photography studios now those of you that have a studio or uh, do any photography work outside of your home <laughs> These look vastly different than the than the studios today. Today we have we bring our own light into the studio. We have um, flashes and we have strobes. They didn't have those in the 1800s. And in fact, um, most of the textbooks of the time, and there are quite a few, and you can find them either you can get copies off of the internet. Amazon sells a couple of different books. They sell the the um, keepers of light. Um, you can you can get a, a, a reprint copy of the Silver Sunbeam. They all had a chapter in their book, usually early in the book, on how to make a, a, a studio. Uh, both the dark house where you, where you exposed using sunlight, and the dark closet where you would develop your your you would you pour your chemicals and develop. Um, and that was this was this this is actually taken from a book that was written in 1902, 1903 by Edward Estabrook called uh, The Ferrotype and How to Make It. So, although the Civil War was most known as the the age of the um, uh, of the wet collodion process because the Civil War was documented using wet collodion, actually the first use of it in a battle was the Crimean War. Ironically, we're still fighting the Crimean War. Um, and after Archer introduced in 1851 the process, the British Royal Society um, hired Roger Fenton to go photo make some photographs because they were spending a lot of money on the Crimean War. And so they sent uh, Fenton out to make some photographs of what was going on so that they could raise more money for their efforts. Um, he made this photograph. It's on the right. Um, if you look up, if you Google the Valley of the Shadow of Death, you will see the photograph by Roger Fenton. Um, and it was this photograph that came back to the Royal Society and um, Alfred Lord Tennyson um, actually saw this photograph and wrote his famous poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, in, uh, art imitates art. Um, of course, it comes from the Psalm 23 in the Bible. Um, but this was the first known war photography. And of course, obviously, it's, it's affected every war since. Um, it, it greatly affects how it, it brings the world to us. And this is really the first example of the world being brought back to us. Now, most of you all are familiar with a fellow by the name of Matthew Brady. Matthew Brady first started off making daguerreotypes. He was actually taught how to do it by Samuel Morris, Samuel F.B. Morris, the inventor of the, of the uh, telegraph. Morris um, introduced Brady to the daguerreotype and he started working with it, but then in the 18, 1850s, he, he switched over to the amber types, the glass plates. And for the Civil War, he thought he was going to become very rich by making all these photographs on negatives, making these glass plate negatives of the Civil War. And then he would then, after the war was over, sell them because people would, want, would just want to see the glorious battles of the Civil War and, that, um, and he could make a killing. He died broke. He went bankrupt because after the war, nobody was there was no more taste for the for 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 the war, and he never sold any any of his his, his photography. He actually was also not a very good photographer at all. In fact, rarely after the 1850s did he even make any photographs on his own because by the time of the Civil War, he was almost completely blind. But he had a lot of really, really, really good um, assistants working for him, primarily Alexander Gardner, James Gardner, O'Sullivan, Pyrrell, George Barnard. Some of you may have heard of George Barnard. I'll talk about him in a second. And, and many others. And each would have a traveling darkroom. They would go out to different places 
where the battles of the Civil War were. Um, and, and so Brady was actually the businessman, and he stayed in Washington, D.C. and ran the business while his assistants went out to the field in their mule-drawn carts, horse-drawn carts, and, and made the photographs of the battles. Now, the most famous of these is Alexander Gardner. Um, Gardner was uh, uh, a Scottish Scottishman who had immigrated to the United States. Um, he made many photographs of the Civil War, probably the largest number of all of the photographers in the Civil War. But his most famous photographers ph photographs were a series of photographs that he made during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. Um, in February of, of uh, 1864, he made the photograph on the right. And that photograph um, is in the Smithsonian. You'll see that it's a glass plate negative. Um, you can, it's a print made from a glass plate negative. You can see the, the glass itself is cracked. But it's the last known photograph of Abraham Lincoln before he was assassinated. So it's a rather famous photograph. As I said, it's, it's in the Smithsonian. The Gardner was quite the, quite the photographer and um, quite prolific. Along with, now, Gardner was primarily pho made photographs in the north. And Barnard primarily made photographs in the South. In fact, he he was on the he actually was on the Sherman campaign. He rode with Sherman um, in his um, urban renewal project for the state of Georgia, um, and basically documented the the Southern campaign, Sherman's Southern campaign. Um, and in fact, the photograph on the right comes from a series of photographs that are actually still in, up in in. Uh, Athens at the University of Georgia. That's the Atlanta at, at, at the time of the Civil War. Um, and so, and, and he also made a ser the series of the photographs of the city burned and, and of the battle itself. So most of the, at the time, the albumen print was the best way to make a print, which was you would take a, albumen uh, egg whites, which dried clear, Put the chemicals, the light sensitive chemicals, into the print, and then pour those, pour that onto the paper, and expose it through the negative, so that it became a print. Um, and actually, people still make albumin prints today. Um, it's it's not that difficult a process to to, to work with. Um, but around the time of the about the between the 1860s and the eight, uh, around uh, the 1900. Um, literally millions of albumin prints were made. Guys would travel around in their little carts after the wars, um, going up to people's homes and saying, would you like to have a portrait made? And they would make, take your photograph on glass, they would print it on albumin, they would wash off your, the photograph and go to the next house and make the next photograph. And so you had something for your family. And you would, they were called carte de vistes if you had it made in a studio, carte de visite, if you were if, for the, the you know, card to visit, the visiting card. Um, and they also made them into calling cards, and um, typically they were about a four by five card, about so big. Um, and I have one. It's of my great grand, great 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 grandparents. Um, I've dated it to 1895. Um, it's kind of faded with with age. I mean, it's only it's over 125 years old. Um, but I defy anybody to tell me that you're going to have a JPEG that lasts 125 years. Um, this photograph is kind of faded, but you can still see the, his beard. You can see the growl on both of their face because they had to sit still for about 30 seconds to have the photograph made. It's, it's still a, a, a viable photograph today. Um, the problem with wet collodion was that you had to actually ex had to once you coated the, the collodion on the plate and sensitized it, you had to expose it, develop it, and fix it within um, the time that it would take for the collodion to dry. Once collodion dries, it no longer becomes the, the, the salts are no longer viable and you cannot make a photograph. So if you wanted to go out to the field, and make a landscape photograph, you had to take a dark room with you. And there were very elaborate dark rooms and boxes, and guys had these huge heavy backpacks, and they would set up a portable dark room in the field and they would make their, their, their photographs. Um, but it was still rather limiting in terms of the subjects. In 1871, Richard Leach Maddox came up with, figured out 
that he could take gelatin, which is just like your jello that you can get at the grocery store today, um, and put the silver bromide into it. And once it's dry, it remained light sensitive. Um, a, a couple of years after that, a British uh, a, a fellow by the name of Bennett discovered a way to dr make it an actual emulsion so that you could handle it. It wouldn't crack. Um, he came up with some, some additives to the chemicals. And then the real important um, this, uh, happening came in 1879 when this banker, he was actually an amateur photographer, like many of us who started off as amateurs or still are amateurs. And, and I'll re remind all of you all who are still amateurs that Bobby Jones, the great golfer, was an amateur his entire career. George Eastman was an amateur photographer. Um, but he was a better businessman, but he came up with a way of actually taking the glass plates and putting the gelatin on them. So suddenly you had these glass plates, which were durable and would last for literally centuries if treated properly. And he founded the Eastman Film and Dry Plate Company in 1881. And they say that the rest is sort of history. Um, that if to review where we've come from, we've had three basic materials that would hold these light sensitive substances, uh, collodion, albumin, egg whites, and uh, gelatin. And all three of these would work and various, various ways of making photographs work, but it was the gelatin that was the most flexible. And getting there, we found that albumin would, would um, work with paper, Archer and collodion, Maddox, Kind of invented the gelatin and Eastman made them viably commercially viable um, and then as you know as we know that these these wet if you've ever seen a dry plate they're just really cool they're just cool um, I have a, a, a series of white uh, of uh, plates that were made um, probably in about the 1830s um, portraits my dad had a box full of plates that were made during uh, the the uh, completion the American part phase of the, the Panama Canal, um, and, and, and today I have his, his prints from those. But all of these things were bringing us up to a point where we now enter the modern era of photography. And I'm not going to bore you all. There, there's some very cool stuff about where, where this all went. But Eastman, um, basically, by the time he died, he owned the city of Rochester, New York. Um, the he founded the symphony. He was a philanthropist of the arts. He um, treated his employees well, um, but he was also a pretty cutthroat businessman. And in 1885, in addition to just owning the plates, he figured out that he could put it on uh, an acetate, plastic, um, that had been invented not long before that. He could put his emulsion, on the same emulsion on the acetate, and could release the roll film and in 1888 he came out with the title Kodak and it's just a made up word it means absolutely nothing except that he thought it sounded cool and his mom thought it sounded cool so they came up with Kodak and Eastman Kodak um, became the the premier um, maker of all things photography starting in the late 1880s um, the name it the it the, the name stuck. Um, he couldn't keep up with orders, so he re, re he had to grow the company uh, as more than just the dry plate company. He needed an infusion of capital, so he created the Eastman Company in '89, and then three years later came up with a company we now know and love called Eastman Kodak. Um, also in 1889, he patented the process for nitrocellulose film. Some of you have heard about nitrocellulose film, which um, was in continu continued to be in use up until the 1950s. But in the real the real breakthrough came in 1900 with his his introduction of the Brownie camera. Now the Brownie was basically a cardboard box. This is not an original Brownie. In fact, there are only between I think there are four known of the six original that were made. Um, maybe it's three. Um, I know that one of the six is at the Eastman Museum, um, but basically it was a cardboard box. And the company would, it would be loaded, came loaded, 
It cost a dollar, and it came loaded with a roll of film, a hundred pictures. And now each picture, at the time, they didn't have a rebate, or a, a, that that would crop the crop the image, and so the image circle projected by the lens was round. And so you would get, you would have your, you would pay at the time a, a dollar, which was now thirty-five dollars, worth about thirty-five dollars. They would sell you a camera with the film in it. You would shoot your 100 pictures, and you would send the pic, the camera back to Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. And they would take your, they would develop your prints for you, make them prints, and send them back to you. And um, they and they would reload, they would reload your camera with more film. Talk about a, a permanent market. You know, you, there's it, the, the best marketing in the world couldn't come any closer than. Than, than the lock on that 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 um, Eastman had on his his business, and in fact the brownie actually continued up until the 1970s. The browning brownie um, line, the brown the uh, the, the the brand, um, and the last brownie camera. Um, some of you all remember 110 film. Um, some of you remember it was Shivers, but he was also a cutthroat businessman. So there were all kinds of lawsuits and patent acquisitions and um, consent decrees and he was sued by the government in the in 1913 lost and they had to sell off part of the company um, but even up until um, the 1950s kodak film was almost exclusively used for in in um, motion pictures um, he was a sole 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 supplier the motion picture patents company and this is where history kind of accelerates. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of the 1900s because history really accelerates. There's technology improvement after technology improvement after technology improvement after technology improvement up until um, 1975 when a Kodak employee, Steve Sasson, in invented the first handheld digital camera. Who knew that Kodak invented the digital camera? Um, but the problem was that the Kodak company said, nah, Nobody's ever going to want to buy that junk, um, and as we all know, the rest is kind of history. And by 19, by 2012, Kodak had filed for Chapter 11, and its pieces had been sold off. There's still Kodak in a couple of different instantiations. You can still buy Kodak film, you can buy Kodak chemistry, but primarily it's being made by the Chinese. I'm going to talk for just a minute before uh, before I turn it back to everybody about some photographers and note. We're almost done. But um, one of my favorite, and these are some of my favorite photographers. They're not the only ones. But um, one of the most important photographers of the 19th century was Juliet Marga Cameron. Juliet Cameron um, was given a camera by her, her daughter and son-in-law. Um, and she just loved the messiness of wet collodion process. Um, she took it to Africa. Her husband was well off and she didn't have to do anything she was well connected and so she made the, the photograph that we, we talked about and and had was a relative of John Herschel in fact her her son Henry Cameron was named for John Herschel I mean he's the one who actually taught Herschel actually taught her wet collodion photography um, I have I was lucky enough to see a, a collection of her work at the um, Art Institute of Chicago a few years ago and her images are just stunning. They're just as good today as they were in the 1880s when she was making, 1870s, 1880s when she was making photographs. They are stunning. And her photographs were presented next to Alfred Stieglitz's photographs. And some of y'all are familiar with Stieglitz. Um, I encourage you to, 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 if you don't know about Stieglitz, to read everything you can about Stieglitz. Um, the man was brilliant. He was the first modern art performer, uh, promoter. Um, he discovered many of the photographers that we all know of today, um, and he he was he was in the heart of the New York art scene. He also married uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, the famous painter. Although for most of their lives they lived apart, estranged. Um, and Stieglitz is my favorite photograph of Stieglitz is the Flatiron Building in, in New York City. Um, and then one of my personal favorite photographers is Edward Steichen, 
Um, Steichen is credited with actually taking photography from just being a pure image and here's here's real life captured he would turn it into art um and in fact uh stieglitz called him the greatest photographer ever lived um and he steichen was the most published uh photographer in the 14 years that stieglitz published his camera work um i have a copy of every camera work magazine in a book um Ansel Adams once said, if you want to make great photographs, you have to look at lots of great photographs. And these these early photographers made some of the most phenomenal photography, photography in history. He also happened to have been the director of photography of the New York Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, um, and and created some of you may have heard of the, the exhibit uh, of the family of man, um, which was in 2003 named on UNESCO's World Registry of Important Historical Artifacts. And this is my one of my favorite photographs of all history. Um, at its day in, in 2006, this photograph sold for $2.9 million, a print of this photograph. Um, it's hand colored. It was a black and white photograph, but it was hand colored. Um, but to me, just the, the, the range of tones in this image is just stunning. I absolutely love this, the, the, the pond. Um, it is one of the best photographs in history and it's recognized as such. And then of course there's Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams was perhaps the most important um, photographer in technology of photography. He advanced the art of technology more than anybody else. If you are familiar with the zone system, congratulations everyone should still be using the zone system um, and using his books the negative the camera and the print and then finally one of my personal favorite photographers and who got me interested in wet collodion photography sally mann sally mann is about mm, she's maybe five five years older than me five or ten years older than me so we're not that old difference in age but she just does some stunning work in 2010, I saw a documentary on PBS about this woman who was in Virginia and she would take these chemicals and she would pour it on a piece of glass and she would stick the piece of glass in the camera and she would make these photographs. And it's what interested me in the process. And it was about a year and a half ago that I actually took a course, took a workshop in how to make these photographs. And it's thanks to Sally Mann. I also encourage you to study her work. Um, she was at the High Museum had an exhibit at the high just um, three or four years ago, just before the pandemic. Okay, here, really the last slide I've got. And then I can take some questions if you've got time for a couple of questions. Um, but there is a book, and interestingly, um, Ansel Adams isn't, nor, nor Sally Mann are listed in this book, but it is a really good book. And I suspect that the reason that neither of them are in the book it's because they wouldn't let their photographs be used in the book. There's a book titled 50 Photographers You Should Know. Um, and if you don't know some of these photographers, if you don't know Diane Arbus, Eugene Adige, Richard Avedon, um, Cameron, Kappa, Bresson, Curtis, um, if, you, if you don't know Walker Evans, if you don't know these photographers, you need to. Um, this is where we came from. Everything that any person who judges your images it's been influenced by the work of these photographers, um, professional photographers today, influenced by work of these photographers. Um, you have to know where you came from to be able to know where you're going with your own art form, your own work. Um, and so I encourage you to find this book. It's actually Prestel is the name of a company in Berlin who published the book. And it has some phenomenal photographs from, from these photographers. Uh, Moybridge's photographs of the, the, the horses, um, Maplethorpe, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the uh, underground scene in, in New York, um, Bresson, uh, the, uh, uh, the decisive moment. I will say that there really are 51 photographers, not just 50 that you should know, because the 51st photographer is me. Uh, and I hope you, that you remember this presentation and my work and you visit my website. I try to keep it updated. It's hard to do. Um, but you can reach me. You can go to michaelboatwright.com or you can email me or call me if you've got any questions 
I don't want to keep you all too late, but Hylos, that's pretty much it. If folks have got questions, I'm happy to take them now or turn it back to you. Michael, thank you for that. That was a whole lot of information in a short period of time, apparently. But you 14 know, billion you, years. 14 billion <laughs> years in an hour and a half. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Have we got anybody got any questions? I think you got to explained it pretty well then, apparently. Well, uh, hi, Liz, I've got one. Uh, Michael, I, I noticed that your humility is, is only uh, is only seconded by your ability. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's funny. Enough. If you if you saw the photograph I made today, <laughs> you would know that's really true. <laughs> uh, but but thank you. I, I really enjoyed the show. Um, and it was a show and a good one. Um, I think like most of us, we had inklings of all this stuff, but I like how you tied it all together. Sometimes putting close it out the recording thread. right now, though. 